What's up, friends? Join us for another exciting episode of on, on.NET. Today, I'm having Mike Russo's to talk about dealing with performance issues in .NET. Join us. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of On.NET. Today, we're going to learn how to fix performance issues on our .NET applications with my very good friend, Mike Russos, from the uh, .NET engineering team. How are you, Mike? Doing well. Thanks, Christos. How are you? I am great, and I'm really looking forward to uh, learning about the stuff that we have to cover today. But tell us a little bit about yourself and your team and what you guys do. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So I'm a software engineer on the .NET customer engagement team. That is a part of the .NET engineering org that's customer facing. So we mm. go out, we work with some of our larger customers to make sure they're able to be successful with new .NET and Azure app development products. We take what we learn there, bring it back to the rest of the team, and we use those learnings to improve the development experience for all of our .NET devs. So we come back, we fix bugs, write blog posts, create videos like this one, uh, create tools, uh, and so on, so that everyone's able to uh, have a smooth experience uh, developing for .NET. Nice. So uh, you also deal with performance. And as we all know, security and performance are usually afterthoughts for every developer. Like we try to write something and push it out of the door, and they're like, oh, yeah, it's not running as efficiently. Yeah. So um, how can we look into performance, and what kind of tools do we have now disposal to help us be more efficient? And hopefully before we even go into production, right? Mm -hmm. yes, yes, absolutely. It Performance is one of those tricky things where you want to be mindful of it all the time, but mm -hmm. before you go into production, you're like once once you're sort of ready to to release, you, you really do want to go back and make sure you've got performance tests, load tests, stuff like that, not just functionality. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that we've found working with customers is that oftentimes when my team's involved, it's because they've started using .NET 5 or they've started you know, something like that maybe uh, they're trying to adopt .NET 6 and they're running into performance issues and they're not quite sure how to diagnose them because things have changed since .NET Framework. It used yes. to be everyone knew how to use sort of the, the, the common tools for .NET, uh, but now you might be running on Linux or you mm -hmm. might be running in a Docker container and all of a sudden some of the usual diagnostics techniques don't work. Yes. So one of the things we've been... Uh, really working on the past few years is coordinating with the diagnostics folks on the .NET team to make sure that we have tools that work for these new products. Right. So that's some of what I'm going to be talking about today is the way that we can use some of these uh, .NET CLI tools um, like .NET Dump, .NET Trace, uh, .NET Counters as really easy cross-platform portable ways of diagnosing issues. Nice. And you said something very important. These tools are now part of the CLI, not part of any ID. So you don't have to have Visual Studio. You don't have yep. to have, you know, in the past, I remember certain features, especially around monitoring, were only available in Visual Studio Enterprise. Now we can run them from the CLI anywhere, whether it's yep. uh, Mac OS, Linux, or Windows. And that is great because it helps us decouple tooling and also be more efficient and not tied to a specific OS or tool chain. Perfect. Yep. And do you have a demo for us or demos? I do, yes. So uh, I'd like to go through a demo. I, we've done a few of these uh, on.NET shows already where I've, I've mm -hmm. shown some of these tools off in different scenarios. Uh, we've looked at um, you know, memory leaks. We've looked at diagnosing high CPU usage. So I've got another one today where we're going to be using .NET Trace again, but we're going to use it with a slightly different tracing profile so okay. that we can understand how memory is being allocated. Perfect. So, uh, yeah, let's go ahead and go through that. If we can share my screen, I'll, I'll take us through the demo. So, um, as before, uh, I've got a web app that I created, and it's a small contrived web app just to showcase a problem. But this web app is not performing well. You can see mm -hmm. I, I ran a quick uh, load test here with the Siege command line tool, and I'm only getting like 50 requests per second, which for a very simple app that doesn't do much yes. is, is, is pretty poor. Yes. So the question is, what's, what's going on? Now, in the past, we've talked about using .NET counters as a command line way of easily observing sort of that high-level performance landscape. But in this case, I'm actually running in Azure App Service, so we can use the Azure tools to see some of that. Um, oh, I know on one of our 
previous videos, we did a, a Linux app service environment. So this time we're doing Windows for variety, but these tools work very similarly anywhere. Yep. But you can sort of see when we come in here, you can tell I ran my, my, my test a couple of times over the past hour. You can sort of see at the point response. where requests went up. Yeah, yep. response time also was up. But, um, you know, I'm not going to dive real deep into all of the Azure monitoring mm -hmm. tools, but just know that there's integration with app level monitoring through application insights, as yes. well as log analytics for gathering logs from your VMs, your app, and sort of putting them all together in an easily queryable way. Uh, for, for just a quick overview, we can go look at the app service plan that this web app is a part of, and it's going to show us high level information like CPU usage, memory usage, and so on. And we can already start to get some clues here that, okay, CPU usage was very high during the couple mm -hmm. minutes when I was running this test, as well as memory usage. So with memory usage being high, we might think, oh, well, are we running out of memory? Is there some sort of leak? But we, we didn't have any failures, 100% um, availability. So I, I, I don't think that we're running out of memory, but we're using a lot of memory yes. and we're using a lot of CPU. So given that, I think it's interesting to come in here and as a next step, uh, profile the application to understand what's going on during these busy periods. Because there's a few things it could be. Now, when mm -hmm. I see both CPU and memory being high, I begin to suspect, okay, well, what are we doing with our memory? Um, mm -hmm. what's, what's the GC doing? But you always want to profile and get more data. I, I know one of our uh, GC devs uh, always says that people are quick to accuse the garbage collector of being a problem, and it seldom is. So you really need yeah. to get the data to understand. In this case, it's really that my app is misusing memory, and that's what we're going to find out. So the way that I like to do this, last time we used .NET Trace, we're going to do that again. And you mm -hmm. probably remember, like we said earlier, .NET Trace is a command line tool, runs easily in any environment. So we can use, if I come over to the Let's see. Well, oh, I have to go back to the web app itself rather than the app yep. service plan. And we have Kudu. the advanced right. tools here, Kudu. Yes. So this is a way that we can connect to our app service environment for debugging and diagnostic purposes. So we get a lot of information as far as like the environment, uh, system information, environment variables that are set, things like that. You've got the process explorer where you can see the processes that are running in this mm -hmm. app service environment. Um, I'll give this a minute to load. Uh, so we can see here's our uh, you know, IIS process because we're in Windows yep. now. This is hosting our app. The one with the SCM tag next to it is the Kudu mm -hmm. process itself. So you can ignore right. this one. This is just the, the diagnostic process running along next to it. Okay. And there's actually a start profiling button here. So, so mm -hmm. it's for simple scenarios. You don't even have to connect to the environment. You could just click start profiling wait a minute, click stop profiling, it'll download a trace that you can open up in Visual Studio or in Perfview to get an idea of where time is being spent in your threads. Right. So that's super easy. Now, in our case, we're going to want kind of one level deeper diagnostic mm -hmm. information. So I'm not going to use that here, but it can be a good starting point. If all yes. you care about is where's the time being spent that my CPU is running, this will give that to you. It's, with, it's a starting with, point, with, right? If you exactly. don't know where the problem is, you start there and then you start yes. digging deeper once you isolate the issue. Exactly. Cool. So it's 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 pretty pretty nice. Uh, for, for our purposes, though, I'm going to go into the debug console and go to CMD. And what we have here is a um, command prompt running inside of my browser connected to my Azure app service environment. I can do a dir and we can see, you know, ASP.NET stuff, the site. And in fact, I don't even need to do a dir. You, up here, you can manage files, you can download things, you can navigate around. Yeah. And so anything that you could do from a command line, now we're able to execute here in our app service environment via Kudu. Nice. So uh, like I said, I, we're gonna use .NET Trace because that's the preferred tool mm -hmm. in .NET 5 and up for collecting a performance trace. So since it's a .NET um, SDK tool, we can install it right from the command line. In previous videos, I showed how you could down, you could just download the binary from the internet, and that works mm -hmm. if you don't have the SDK available. In this case, we do have a .NET SDK installed in this environment. You can see we've got the .NET 5 SDK present. Sure. So we can just install it as a .NET SDK CLI tool. So we just mm -hmm. do .NET tool, uh, let's see, .NET tool, install, oh, if I can type right, install, install it globally, .NET trace. And that's Ooh. going to download and install. Well, in this case, I already installed it because I <laughs> tried this out earlier. But if it weren't already installed, that would go ahead and install the .NET trace tool. Perfect. All right. So then 
you execute it by just running .NET trace. And, oh, it's not on the path though. So path equals, uh, I mean, I, or I suppose I could just give the full. Uh, when you install it, it does tell you where it goes. I don't just magically know this, but uh, when it installs, it will install it into the, uh, into the tools directory here. So if I do that, now I should be able to call it uh, pretty directly. Okay, so uh, we've got .NET trace. The primary command we're going to be using is .NET collect. Mm -hmm. We could also do .NET PS to see like the processes that it could trace. Profiles we're going to use later on today. Okay. But let's start with just a real simple .NET trace collect. Um, and you know what? I'm going to go look at the process explorer to see what process ID I need. I could also do .NET trace PS because um, mm -hmm. I did not think to note it earlier. It is 4268. So we're going to collect a trace from uh process 4268 and we're just to start with we're going to use the default profile which samples the cpu it collects perf counter information and that's going to give us kind of a nice um broad view of what's happening in our app and then we'll say let's let's con collect for 30 seconds let's say um you don't have to specify the oh and i this is going to be interesting i'm going to have to actually apply some load so let's do that Okay, so we've got we've got a bunch of traffic going out to our yes. site now. We are collecting. You don't have to specify the duration. You just hit Control C when you want to be done. But I find that when I'm working in the Kudu con console, uh, Control C is not reliable. So I just use the duration right. flag to say exactly how long I want to trace. And these things don't have to be long. At least in the case of ASP.NET apps, mm -hmm. when you've got dozens or hundreds of users hitting the app and it's under a lot of load. If you profile for 30, 60, 90 seconds, you're probably going to capture all of the interesting stuff that's going on. Right. And some of the tracing can get large. You don't want to sit here for half an hour tracing. You can just do it for a minute or two and that's going to be sufficient. Cool. All right. So we've got our uh, trace and you can see it's, you know, just got like a timestamp and .NET trace here. Um, it's like 17 megs. I'm not going to download it. It'll kill our stream. But I, I do have, uh, I, I did this exact same thing earlier and I, okay. and I copied it down. So we'll take a look at that one. So from, from a security perspective, do we need to delete the traces after we finish the uh, investigation? So uh, that's probably best. I mean, hopefully this is an environment that no one would get to unless they're you know, they have the right authorization anyhow, but yeah, you're going to have sensitive information in here. Yeah. So just as a defense in depth measure, this is the, this is going to be considered, you know, sensitive content because yes. it has, you know, everything that's on the heap. So it's going to have uh, all of the requests that are coming in. It's going to, yeah. you'll be able to find in memory, any secrets that are stored sort yes. of at runtime. So yep. yeah, cool. Not something we'll leave sitting around, but you know, deleting it's as simple as just clicking here when we're done with it, which is nice. Well, always clear out your investigation, you know? That's right. Yep. Good, good point. So I think last time we used Visual Studio mm -hmm. to uh, look at our trace. This time I'm going to use Perfview, which is a tool that the .NET team created specifically for um, analyzing .NET performance. And I'll explain why in a minute here. So this is, got, is this a cross-platform tool that runs everywhere? So Perfview is not, unfortunately. No, so Windows only. Windows only. .NET Trace is cross-platform, so you can use yep. that on, you know, in any environment. You can run that on Linux to collect mm -hmm. the, 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 the trace, but okay. then you have to move it back to your Windows machine to actually analyze it. Sure. Okay. okay. So I'm going to open up Trace 1, which was the first one I captured when I was mm -hmm. testing this out. And... You know, you've got all the stuff we've seen previously. Like you look at events to get information on like your 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 event counters. Like, hey, you know, when did we add new threads to the thread pool? When did we start jitting? Stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You've got your thread time, which is going to show where our CPU time is being spent. And this yep. might be this place I would start. I'd look at that, see what's going on. But where we're going to find something interesting in this case is in the GC stats. Mm -hmm. So in this memory group folder, you have information on what the garbage collector is doing. And this is the reason that I'm using Perfview here instead of uh, Visual Studio. Visual Studio is good at opening up these dumps and analyzing the events, the, the the CPU stacks. It doesn't have as good of a view yet into the GC stats. And that's something that I know is, is being worked on uh, in VS because we want it to sort of be at parity. But at the moment, I do still find Perfview is a little bit more useful for this particular view, okay. which, is, which is why we're here. So... When we open this up, it gives us a lot of information on what the garbage collector was doing while we mm -hmm. collected that that performance trace. Uh, one of the first things that stands out to me is it shows my pause time. It mm -hmm. says that 
the application was paused 19% of the time it was profiled for the, the GC to run, which is extremely high. We, we yeah. should pause extremely briefly unless we're doing a Gen 2 garbage collection, in which case you'll have a short pause time. But Gen 2 GCs should be rare. Yeah. In this case, though, we see we're, we're paused 19% of the time that we were running. The only thing the app was doing was garbage collecting. It wasn't serving requests or anything else. And if we look at the number of... Uh, garbage collections that happened, you can see there were 30 GCs in 30 seconds, which is on the high side. But mm -hmm. the thing that's especially remarkable is that 28 of those were Gen 2, which is which is problematic because, like I said, Gen 2 GCs are when we're cleaning up all of the objects, including the large object heap. It involves a uh, longer pause. You can see that on average, we were paused for 160 uh, milliseconds yeah. every time this happened. Yeah. Um, and so overall, we had a total pause time of like four and a half seconds for these 28 Gen 2 GCs. And that's going to have a large impact on our performance. That's going to impact our ability to serve these requests. Right. So we've got a pretty good idea now that at least part of our performance problem is that we're pausing a lot for these Gen 2 GCs. Mm -hmm. Further down, it will also tell us w uh, what triggered GCs at, um, at a high level. And we can see that they are all triggered by allocating large objects, which is not a surprise since they were Gen 2. So when you're doing, uh, what, I, I, I'm just trying to decide how much garbage collector to, to talk about here, but I guess just at a high level, um, allocating large objects would be any objects that's, that's larger than about 85K. That's sort of the cutoff where, where the, the CLR considers an object large. And at that point, it's no longer efficient to move it around in, in the heaps. So at this point, it now goes on the large object heap where it's not going to move. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's expected that these sorts of large objects should be rare, relatively long-lived, because it's inefficient to clean them up. And what's happening is we're triggering GCs for all of these large object allocations, but because we need to clean the large object heap, as opposed to just like the, the Gen 0, Gen 1 heaps, it means that we need to do this full GC and everything needs to pause. Right. So here's the problem. The question now is, why are we doing this? So, 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 so we sort of know what went what? wrong, but yes. we don't know the root of, well, where in my code do I need to make a change? So yes. for that, we're going to take one more trace. Um, so let's go back out to uh, Kudu. Mm -hmm. And over here, remember when we ran .NET Trace, there was this list profiles option where you can tell it what sort of sampling it should be doing, what sort of event counters it should be looking at. Oh, okay. sorry, it's not dash dash, just, uh, it's just a command. So I, I like the inconsistency there. <laughs> some of them are dashes, yeah. some of them are no dashes, some so of them are double dashes. the idea is that there's no dashes <laughs> for those top level commands like collect right. list profiles, but then there's dashes for the arguments and I, I just got it wrong. Ignore me. Yes, yes. I'm being <laughs> so, so the, the default profile is the CPU sampling one, where we're right. going to be monitoring the runtime information, and we're going to be looking at where CPU time is spent. But we GC also have these other profiles. We've got the mm -hmm. database profiles, which is going to capture your database uh, uh, interactions. We also have a couple GC profiles. GC verbose is going to sample object allocations. So when we allocate an object, we... Um, We'll profile and sort of record what that was, where it came from. We also have GC Collect, which is similar to this, but it's not sampling the object allocations. It's only looking at collections, and it's a very low overhead efficient way of tracing. So in the scenario where you were seeing um, sort of intermittent pauses, you weren't sure what the GC was doing, you could run with this GC Collect profile for a very long time. It's going to have a minimal impact on, on your app's performance, and it will create a very small uh, performance trace. So this is, you you could do this for a few hours and, and, and get kind of that broad view of, of what collections are happening. Right. But in our case, we're really interested in allocations. So we're yes. going to use the GC verbose mode. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run the same command as before, except this time, I'm also going to say, uh, let's see, profile. I'm going to specify I want the GC verbose profile. Sweet. So again, we're going to come back over here, make sure that there's something interesting happening. Otherwise, otherwise there will be no allocation, no GC. Mm -hmm. But now with that running, we'll go ahead and run this. So again, this will run for about 30, 30 seconds. seconds. It'll okay. show up up here. Um, and then we can just click this little download button to down. You can see the files already here because it's being written to. But once we're, it's done, we would just click this to download it. Yep. Um, 
Um, you know, rather than wait 30 seconds, uh, again, I already ran this previously. I've, I've got the trace locally, so let's just go ahead and take a look at it. Efficiency. There I you know. Go. So we'll open up Perfew. And trace two is the second one I took using the right. GC verbose profile. So again, you've got the same sorts of events. Um, but the thing that's different about this one is now in the memory group, in addition to the GC stats page, we also have the GC heap alloc information. So this mm. is that uh, a bunch of call stacks of where we were allocating objects. And so right. if you've previously looked at like CPU stacks to see, all right, where's my time being spent? This is a very similar experience, but instead of CPU time, instead it's looking at object allocations. Yep. So we can um, sort this by exclusive time, like, okay, when we allocated, mm -hmm. ultimately sort of at the bottom leaf node of that stack, what was happening, and it is almost entirely large object allocations, because <laughs> my, my app is, you know, just this little sample that all it does is allocate large objects. Yes. So tons of those. But then we can actually drill into this by double clicking on it, and we're going to get a call stack showing sort of how we got to this point. Nice. I'm going to turn off this filter so we get uh, all of the frames. But okay. what we see is that, and I know this is a bit small. I don't think there's a way to v zoom in. So I'm just going to read it to you in case people are trying to view this on their phone and it's super little. But what I see here at the top is large object allocations are almost all of my allocations. And then the next layer down, it says that those large objects are allocated when I was creating instances of a byte array. So, okay, so now I know that I've got some sort of large byte arrays. And this isn't a surprise to me because remember, large objects have to be larger than 85K, which is almost always a string or an array. Right. Like, and typically byte arrays. Mm -hmm. So, typically, someone is allocating a large string, large byte array. In this case, it's byte arrays. And then we can start to drill down and see where that's coming from. And the next layer is this is actually in my code, it's in the target app mm -hmm. uh, module, which I wrote. And I can see that it's in the profile picture service bad type, which is a very suspicious name, <laughs> in the create profile picture method. So I've got this create profile picture method where I'm, I'm trying to mimic uh, a scenario where a user's hitting a web API to like get profile pictures of like their friends on a social media site or whatever. Right. And so we're loading these pictures out of a database, but as part of that, we're allocating these byte arrays and it's causing large object allocations. So right. these are the things that are responsible for doing those allocations that are causing the GC to do so much work and are ultimately slowing everything down. So given this now, I can come over into my app and we can look at what's going on in there. Mm -hmm. So if we look at the profile picture bad thing, you can see, sure enough, this particular class, when we create an instance of it, it creates a new byte array of a mm -hmm. particular size. Um, and look at how we're using this. Let's see, it's in here. We are calling create profile picture, and we're giving the size as 100,000 bytes. Yes. So in a real app, this would be going out to a database and downloading mm -hmm. something. In my case, I'm just filling it with random, random yep. bytes because I, I don't care. But... It, it, you know, if we look at this call stack, it then goes on to say this is coming from my worker controller. Uh, so I can go out to my controllers and look at the worker controller. And sure enough, we've got a loop in here where we've got a loop 30 times. We're going to get one of our friend's profile pictures or whatever when you hit this endpoint. Mm -hmm. And each one of those calls is creating a byte array of 100,000 elements, filling it with random bytes. And then when we return... Uh, okay, and we return to the user saying, okay, we, we, we did that work. Those byte arrays are no longer needed. Now they're going to be cleaned up next time there's some sort of memory pressure in the large object heap. So right. we end up with this churning effect in the large object heap where we've got all these allocations happening, which are slow. Then we mm -hmm. have all of these garbage collections happening, which are even slower. And so this is, this is why my app is slow. Yep. I do have worker fixed controller, which is the exact same thing, except it's using a good profile picture service. And so if I come look at that one, it's basically the exact same thing as that other one. But instead of saying new byte array, which mm -hmm. is going to allocate that object, instead I'm using my the array pool type. So this is part of the, the .NET framework that is basically a pool of buffers you can borrow. Nice. So I'm using the shared array pool and I'm renting uh, an array of the given size, in this case, 100,000 bytes. So I'm gonna get an array now that's at least that large, mm -hmm. but when I'm done with it, 
I call dispose and I call the return method, and that's going to give the, the array back to that pool so it can be reused. So if I have, you know, 30, 50 concurrent users, I may have, you know, a few dozen of these byte arrays that get created within this pool. Mm -hmm. When those calls are done being served, the buffer goes back into the pool. It can be reused, so we don't have to keep cleaning it up. We don't have to keep allocating them, and we it's it's much more efficient. I mean, I, I guess we can come over here, and I can run on the, the worker fixed endpoint instead, and we'll come back here in a couple minutes and see what that looks like. But it's going to be significantly better than this 50, 60 transactions per section we were, second we were getting before because right. we no longer have all of that work happening to allocate and then clean up these short-lived large objects. Nice. So yeah. we, we find the cause and then we work uh, with something more efficient in our collection to make sure that we don't allocate large objects. In effect, that's where it boils down. Exactly. One, one of the performance issues that we come across. Yep. Yep. It's one of the ones we see from time to time. Yeah. And I guess the thing I really, really want people to take away is that, A, this is a performance problem that is real that we see in the mm -hmm. wild. So be mindful of your large objects. Know that the array pool exists. But also, I want people to see these tools and know that they're out there, that we've got tools like Perfue, Trace. These are, these are both tools that I'd highly recommend. We've got, let's see, I've, I know I've got links out to docs. People can go look at, um, if you go out to docs.microsoft.com, just search for .NET Trace. Um, mm -hmm. It's you know, one of these uh, command line tools that's extremely useful, works cross platform. And Perfview is open source now. So you can go out to github.com slash Microsoft slash Perfview. You can download the tool. I know Perfview can be intimidating. So yeah. there are some video tutorials to help you get started. Um, but I, I think, you know, it's a useful tool to have some familiar, familiarity with, even though there are there's a lot going on and it can be a little bit scary. I, I will say, even though we didn't use Visual Studio for this one, there are ways that Visual Studio can help with this scenario. Mm -hmm. So it's not great yet at opening up traces that contain GC information, which right. is why I'm using Perfu. But what Visual Studio can do is it can profile on your dev machine and it can capture a lot of the same information. So if, if you suspect that you've got issues with allocating too many large objects or you've got issues with the GC taking too much time, and you're comfortable in Visual Studio, mm -hmm. one thing that you could do is if you can reproduce that sort of load on your dev box, you can start up Visual Studio and use Alt F2 to start the profiler in Visual Studio. And one yeah. of the options then is you can select .NET object allocation tracking in the Visual Studio profiler. And that's going to give you that same sort of view into, hey, which when are we allocating objects? What in my code is causing those allocations? And you can do some of that same analysis through Visual Studio that way. Perfect. And uh, it's important because one of the things I saw when you were looking at your uh, Azure Blade was like, hey, maybe I can throw some hardware into that. Like maybe I can scale yeah. up my server so it doesn't do that. But as developers, that's not the solution we should be looking at. Right. We should be actually investigating the actual cause because eventually as the application scales or more users are using it, then it can become a real problem. And at some point you'll hit the threshold of how, how much hardware you can throw into the problem. So being yeah. able to like familiarity with the tools and being able to actually look into the traces and uh, figure out what's wrong. It's, it's an important skill. So I would encourage everyone to look at the videos in the series and make sure that they get a little bit more familiar with, um, yep. with analyzing problems. Yep. That's a great point. And, you know, especially with like CPU and memory usage, those are items that eventually in a real, in a well running app will eventually be a bottleneck because the mm -hmm. app's just doing the thing it's supposed to do so much that you do need to scale. But so often you don't need to scale initially. There's, there's optimizations you can make that will allow you to do more with the hardware you already have. And at the end of the day, hardware resources in Azure translate directly to, to money. And so it's going to yeah. be a big cost savings if you can, you know, postpone that that need to scale. Exactly. You don't need to re-architect your solution just to make it more efficient. Just look yep. at the code. Exactly. Perfect. Well, thanks Thanks for uh, coming, Dave, Mike. I mean, this was yeah. extremely useful, and uh, I've learned a lot. So I awesome. appreciate your time, and I hope our viewers will find this useful as well. Let us know your comments or any questions, and we'll include the links to the docs uh, at the video. So thanks, everyone. Have a nice day.